This is a, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, good morning and, uh, and welcome to uh, the, uh, the Who's Faster, a Pirate or Librarian session. I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's been, uh, actually was addressed just in the previous session, uh, about, uh, about Sci-Hub, about um, the ways people get access to content, the uh, perhaps questionable legality of some of that, but the, the, there are reasons why it happens, um, and we want to try and address some of those things today. We have um, four speakers. Oh, it'd be appropriate to tell you who I am. Uh, Adam Chesler, I'm with the American Institute of Physics Publishing, and uh, I'm here to simply guide us through this. But our speakers today, and their biographies are available to you, so I'm not going to read them all to you, but the order in which they're speaking, we have Carolyn Gaffney Gardner, from, the, from Cal State University in Dominguez Hills. We have Heather Wilson from Caltech, uh, Georges Papadopoulos from Adapon, and Scott Al Alberg from Reprint's desk. And what we're gonna try to do today is look at, uh, very broadly, some of the legal, practical, financial, and technical issues uh, surrounding um, access to content and the ways people are are, are trying to address this um, uh, today as opposed to as, as Chuck alluded to uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so without further ado, we'll let Carolyn get started and we do expect to leave time for questions. I'll simply ask that you hold them to the end so that we can cycle through everybody's presentation uh, as best as we can. Um, so thank you for having me. Just a little bit about myself. I'm an information literacy coordinator. So I'm really approaching um, this problem, this issue from the point of view of our users and sort of really like why and how can we um, really look at instruction in ways to really challenge what's happening. So I first got interested in this project when I was on my own personal Twitter timeline and I noticed that there were these tweets with the hashtag I can has PDF. Um, this is just a selection of a few that I saw. And um, so I was very curious about this, tried to do a little more research into what is I can has PDF? What are these people doing? Um, and found that there wasn't a lot out there and so I really started exploring it. Within the tweets we noticed um, all sorts of things like people saying I don't have university access, I can't get this through interlibrary loan, um, I found this one particular tweet, I can't find my own paper don't have access to my own research. Um, and so I was very curious and kind of exploring <laughs> what's happening here, what's being requested, um, and that has continued on into Sci-Hub and LibGen. So in terms of resource sharing outside of libraries, um, there's really sort of two things that are happening. Um, there's peer-to-peer -peer networks, like we just saw with ICANN as PDF. It's a one-to-one -one person exchange. Um, Reddit Scholar has a very robust community. It's got a couple hundred thousand people in it very similar process. People post a DOI, a link to an article, an email address, it's posted, they remove their, their link and their information there. There are closed Facebook groups, and then this is not new, right? This has been happening through email, photocopying articles for colleagues, you know, there's other peer-to-peer -peer ways. It's a little bit cut off at the bottom, but there's also these larger repositories. So we've got Sci-Hub, LibGen, and Avex Home. LibGen has been around since around 2007. It's one of the big repositories that powers Sci-Hub. So there was a study in 2015, I'm probably pronouncing the name wrong, Kavernock, and um, he really looked at kind of what is in LibGen and found that, that for the top three publishers, Elsevier, Wiley, and Springer, there was 68% of their content was in LibGen. So um, without LibGen, Sci-Hub would not exist. And then I'm also curious, you know, who is using these sites? Um, this is pre-John um, Bohannon science article, so I did not have a lot of raw data, but I, I used Alexa internet traffic data to really kind of look at who are visiting these particular sites. Um, so Sci-Hub, since the last time I did this was a year ago, and um, it's gone up about 19,000 places in global rank. So it is growing in popularity. The United States and Brazil are only now just making the top five countries in terms of use. Um, they kicked off Russia and Indonesia. Um, but I point this out to show that it's not particularly just a US phenomenon, even though that may be the context from which 
we're approaching it. Um, and this, of course, does not include mirrors or hard drive versions of Sci-Hub. I was looking at Sci-Hub.bs for this, but there's also Sci-Hub.cc, .io, lots of different mirrors. And for LibGen, which powers Sci-Hub, um, the global rank is significantly higher. And again, the United States and Brazil have moved up, um, kicking out Indonesia and Russia from the top five over the past few years. And I point this up, too, to um, take a look at Iran in particular there and the rank in country. So it's in the top 1,000 websites for Iran. So, you know, kind of I'll let you ponder. What does that mean? So in terms of my methods, and my, my other co-author, Gabriel Gardner, could not be here today, but we really did two things. Um, we archived a bunch of tweets of ICANN's PDF to see what are people requesting. And then our later project, we surveyed users of these peer-to-peer -peer sites, as well as these larger repositories. Um, it was a convenient sample. You know, we're getting people who are using these particular materials. Um, many of them reached out with us with very long emails and voicemails. And then also, um, Bohannon's science piece, um, he was kind enough to give us the raw data as well, so able to take a closer look at that. In terms of who are people using these services, whoops, nope, what is being requested? Important there. Um, when it came to Twitter, it was primarily journal articles. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting is there was no really one journal title or one publisher represented. There were 494 unique journal titles within the 674 unique requests that we analyzed. And I thought that was really surprising. So it wasn't something about a particular big deal or a particular expensive journal that people didn't have access to. It really was across all disciplines, um, all publishers. Likewise, it wasn't just new content that might be embargoed. Only 30% of the requests were published within the last year, though um, life sciences, biomedical sciences definitely had a larger percentage. Arts and Humanities was a very tiny sliver, but they're there. Um, again, in terms of Sci-Hub, the top three publishers downloaded Elsevier, Springer, IEEE. Again, heavy representation from the sciences. So who are the people doing all of this? Um, within our survey, we asked them, you know, do, are you affiliated with a university? Do you have access to journal articles? And again, surprisingly, only 20% said they were not affiliated in any way with the university. I thought this would be much larger. I'm not sure the 6% who are not affiliated, but also not any part of a university, um, what their affiliation status is. Um, grad students did make up a large portion of who was using these services. When we asked them the frequency with which they use these services, grad students use them more than once a week, um, and people who used LiveGen and um, Sci-Hub were more likely to use them more often. ICANN has PDF and Reddit Scholar was very much a like once a month when I can't get an article type deal. We asked them why, what are your motivations for obtaining materials this way? Um, and it was an open-ended question. So we then coded the responses based on different themes that we saw. Um, not surprisingly, lack of access was the number one reason why people said they use these services. Um, there were a lot of people who wrote in our survey, why are you asking me this? Of course, I don't have access, that's why I'm using it this way. Uh, and speed was another one. There were a lot of comments around interlibrary loan and things being slow, which is one of the reasons we got talking is speed was such a pervasive issue, it wasn't just access. Within that, we saw some comments about user experience, some about costs, and of course, there were some people who had um, ideological motives. There was a lot about, you know, open science, free science. Thankfully, this matches up with uh, John Bohannon's survey that he included with his article about Sci-Hub in Science, so we're not totally off base with our smaller sample size. Um, within his large sample size, this is cross-tabulated data on two questions. Have you obtained a pirated journal article through Sci-Hub or other means, despite having access to it? And what's the primary reason you use Sci-Hub? So you can see, among people who have access and people who don't, um, you've got under no access, that is still the primary reason. For people who have access, people who don't, it was their primary motivation. But convenience is in there as well, right? We then kind of drilled down further. Um, people who said they used interlibrary loan, we asked them, well, why aren't you using interlibrary loan here? Um, what determines whether you obtain materials through interlibrary loan or another means? Um, you can see some of my favorite responses are here. There was a lot of slow, takes forever, interlibrary loan isn't free at every institution for users, um, and you know, the $5 charge might be too much. Um, I 
like the last one. That happens to me all the time too. So let me ask them, you know, what do you think about potential copyright or terms of service violations within these different peer-to-peer -peer services, but also these larger repositories? There were a lot of don't cares, whole pages of don't care, don't care. Um, these are some of the more verbose responses. Um, in here, when we asked people what they thought about copyright in terms of service, we saw a lot of responses related to um, ethics and ideology. Um, you know, you can see here this person says data should be free. So why should we care about this? Well, it's probably not going away. Um, so crowdsource communities are motivated by these sharing and reciprocity goals. When our data, we ask people, how often do you post articles? How often do you get articles? And there were very few people who were just leeching off the system. They really are communities doing both. Um, very similar to file sharing of Napster and days of yore. These systems are decentralized. They're largely synonymous. So there's a low likelihood of punishment. And then, um, though I have gotten in some hot water for saying this previously, they are very easy to use. Um, Sci-Hub has a chat bot. You put in a DOI, you automatically get a PDF right there. There's no click through. Um, again, I am Association of American Publishers. Don't write me another letter. I am <laughs> not advocating the use of these services. However, if you did want to look at the usability, there is open access content within these um, things as well. So you can look at one of those open access journals. And again, they have multiple mirrors. So not represented within a lot of this data is the fact that um, folks in Iran and China in particular download um, and put on external hard drives a lot of the data from LibGen and SciHub. So closing thoughts. Again, I'm an instruction librarian, so you know I think one way to address this problem is greater focus in information literacy instruction, particularly on the information has value part of the new ACRL framework. Um, so how do we work to educate users? There were a lot of comments within Twitter about people losing access to library resources when they graduated and not fully understanding what that was all about because all this time, we as librarians have been saying, it's free and not really putting in the, well, you're here and it's actually not really free, we're paying it for you. Um, so we can do a better job there. And then I also think this is a social justice issue as well. It's not a US phenomenon. You know, How do we approach this from a global perspective? References are there. Full study is a preprint in College and Research Library. And again, thanks to my co-author who couldn't be here today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over. Oh, yeah, if you want to contact me. Heather. Thanks, Carolyn. That was so interesting. So I'm Heather Wilson. I am an Acquisitions and Electronic Resources Librarian. So I deal... Ooh. I deal primarily with uh, mostly the linking and technical pieces of this um, and really even in my acquisitions role it's largely a technical role as to how those acquisitions are being accessed. So I want to talk about some reasons people might um, be having those access issues that are not financial um, or they're not maybe even related to whether or not the library has the PDF to begin with. Um, yeah, because there are a number of reasons people may want to use Sci-Hub. Most of this will probably not be news to this room. Um, and just the resonance. So yeah, the first. So some of the things I wanted to talk about first. Did it work? Okay. Um, our linking difficulties might be a major reason that people use Sci-Hub. Of course, open URL failures are a big thing. Um, generally, people working um, with having their searches optimized and having their searches made as ideal as possible, where we are not necessarily always doing so, and then large and complicated networks. This is like my favorite thing to cite all of the time um, ever since I learned about it. I think Ken Varnum is probably here at Charleston. But yeah, the University of Michigan um, did a study on their open URL resolver that I thought, found very interesting. They wanted to see how successful that linking was happening. Um, and just to give you an idea, they started with, um, I want to say it was in the hundreds, but they started with a sample where they, looked at, where they had self-reporting. They had an option for users to self-report when they ran into an issue very quickly. And then they also did pick a sample of articles to use for their own testing and linking. Um, so just to give an idea, this is the direct linking. This is kind of the traditional idea. And you can see the trends over um, you know, different periods where they measured. And it's pretty much what you would expect, you know, around 97%, 94%, um, you know, barring, barring technical difficulties. But then they studied it through their open URL resolver and the numbers came out significantly different. They found consistently that, uh, yeah, they were only successfully linking 63% of the time um, and the most recent sample. 
And so, yeah, that's 40% uh, of articles that are not being linked to through the open URL resolver, and SciHub does not have to deal with this, and so that might be a very good technical reason why somebody might go to a central place. Uh, another thing is the um, optimization of searching uh, that can happen at one level. People are used to searches that have been SEO'd, used to searches that um, have been optimized to make their clicks, one click experience as good as possible. Um, and things like they're focusing on targeting long tail keywords or as we know them, known item searching, people who search for very specific items. Whereas we seem to often be thinking more broadly about concepts, we seem to be often be going a different way. Um, thinking about improving their bounce rate, rate re reducing the number of clicks and keeping people on the page longer, um, and which sounds like something we would really be concerned with. And so, yeah, the, I think the average U open URL linking goes through at least three clicks, and I think there's an average of five on some repositories and other types of open access things. And so as a result, um, yeah, we're certainly not meeting their experience. And the other thing is, of course, large networks. These are, you know, this is the publishing cycle in every place that has, um, and you guys are all familiar with this, every place that has a stop along the way. But it's, of course, important to know that each of these things have different servers, each of these things have different authentication measures. I'm gonna move real fast. <laughs> Another reason might be indexing and discovery insufficiencies. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's just not being exposed. At Caltech, we're very concerned about hybrid OA, but there's also massive metadata failures, and uh, the knowledge base structures don't always meet the content and the arrangement that it has. So one example, oh yeah, the hybrid OA situation. Um, so one of the problems that we're having is that we may not have access to a journal, or we may not be able to subscribe to a journal, but we have researchers who have published open access in that journal. Um, but because we can't list that as one of our holdings, we can't really expose that content. And so that hybrid OA, the open access that's within a journal, it's very difficult for us to list. Um, another situation related to that would be like green OA, uh, which doesn't really often have a lot of the structures that are required for open URL. May not have a DOI, may not have a volume issue, volume or issue number. But SIAB's acting as a search engine, and so therefore it doesn't have to be concerned with those structures. A metadata insufficiency, of course, this is another thing I like to quote every chance I get from Kristen Wilson um, of the GoKB project in at NC State. Um, yeah, the metadata is not always what it should be because there is not really a true caretaker. Um, as she says, publishers are in the business of selling content, not metadata. They're looking to meet the user experience as well in the end um, and not necessarily as concerned with, yeah, getting us all of the things that we need to make those linking, that linking work. And yeah, so that's a huge reason that um, we might have issues that SciHub doesn't necessarily have to worry about. And of course, knowledge-based structures are pretty huge. Um, right now, you know, I think most people probably in here have to work with a knowledge base that's worked at the pub publisher level. You list your titles under the publisher, you list your articles under that, and there's a certain hierarchy here. But if something doesn't have a publisher yet, such as the case of Green OA, or it's in a preprint, or it may not be linked to a title, um, and we're increasingly a repository item, then there's not a good structure for that in the knowledge base. You kind of have to force it in there. Um, and then authentication barriers are, of course, the biggest ones uh, that are probably the most common. So I'll go real fast through these. Um, so, of course, DRM restrictions, you know, as we hear it time and time again. You download, you buy the item, you download it properly, you lose it, you end up, you know, a criminal trying to get it back, or you download it the first time and you're a criminal. I think this is like probably the most, ex, most cited XKCD comic ever. Um, but yeah, they, this is a major issue, and of course, SciHub doesn't have to worry about it, but as long as, you know, we have PDFs and um, eBooks with limited containers, we imagine that this is gonna be a problem. Yeah. And then, of course, user privacy ambiguity is something that's rising. I include this graph just to show um, this is from a Pew Research Center study on privacy, um, where they asked people, you know, the different extent to which they're concerned about their privacy. But I mainly just include it to show there's a rise, a growing trend where people are concerned about their privacy. So things where people have to create logins, things where people are very aware that they're giving personal information, it seems to be on the rise. And moreover, the idea that, that information has value. So even people who aren't necessarily concerned about their rights are suddenly aware that have a commodity um, thanks to the global conversation, which I'm thrilled about. But as a result, that's something um, that becomes less problematic when you have fewer logins and pseudonymous <laughs> um, operations. All right, so those are my references, um, and this is me. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, George Papadopoulos, and I'm the CEO of Atipon. Let me tell you a few things about Atipon. Atipon is a technology company 
uh, in the business of delivery, of content delivery, building the websites and delivering the content for a, for a number of uh, publishers. Um, we uh, serve about 10,000 articles and about 40% of all research content. So we, ex we work exclusively for publishers um, and we try to provide them technical solutions to any issues that they have. We don't make any judgment as to the business models or anything else or the social issues. Uh, these are between uh, publishers, regulatory authorities and libraries to solve. Uh, we're there just to advise on a technical level. So uh, Sci-Hub, of course, has been a big issue for publishers. Um, many of them don't know some of the other places. Uh, they know Libgen and some of the other places where the content is leaking. And of course, that's a problem for them uh, because it threatens to destroy the whole ecosystem of, of publishing. Um, from a technology point of view, however, I really want to thank the pirates uh, in this case. Um, it's been 20 years. I've, I've, started company, I've started the company with the first journal that went online, uh, the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And uh, really, uh, it has been a struggle to make publishers and I think to some extent librarians uh, move over from these uh, uh, standards that were established back in 95, the proto-web, as I call it, standards, which were uh, the IP authentication, and a little later, a PDF didn't exist in 95. Uh, I think it, it came around 97 or 98, I don't remember exactly, uh, and PDF. And it's been a struggle because everybody has really acknowledged all these 20 years that these were actually bad standards. They're not really um, serving the users well. They don't provide the, the right user experience. However, nobody wanted to change them. So this, this is the, the way, the reason I actually thank the pirates because they're forcing the change that you know, the technology companies could not actually force the publishers to do. So um, let's start with the big one, IP authentication. So IP authentication, everybody has acknowledged that it doesn't actually identify the institution very well that it creates problems for the librarians, but they always have to update their IPs in over 50 or 100 sites or 200 sites, I don't know how many sites anymore. Um, and of course, there's all the problems with remote off-campus access or um, institutions that don't even have a stable IPs, all kinds of things are there uh, that you find once you go into that. Um, and um, there is really no reason for that. The technology for us to uh, move over from IP authentication and create this frictionless ex experience that Sci-Hub has, where you actually hit a, hit a DOI and there you go to the content that you're, you know, and of course Sci-Hub doesn't care about entitlements, but we assume entitled content. For me as a technologist, the biggest problem is that many, many users actually have access to the content, but they're so confused with all the rules and all the Sibolet engines and all the things that they have to do that they actually lose access to the content. Uh, so for me, it's very important that a user logs in on his device once in his lifetime you know, from his institution, and from then on, okay, he logs in without ever being asked to any publisher. Okay? What is his IP? What is his username? You know, he's not handed any tokens, codes, whatever that he has to put into his device every, every time he starts a session. And this is something that we've actually demonstrated right now to the publishers. And it, the project is called, I think, Universal Research Access. And uh, hopefully you're going to see it rolled out uh, in 2017. So of course, once you don't have IP authentication, there is no more Sci-Hub. Because Sci-Hub really depends on having IP authenticated access through institutions. Okay. So let's go to the next one. Since we are in authentication, I thought, let's throw passwords uh, into it as well. I mean, OK, I understand that you know, we've used usernames and passwords for a long, long time, and we're getting used to them by now. Of course, we're always hearing the news uh, uh, about compromised sites, about stolen passwords, about what you don't know, of course, is all the password cracking attempts, phishing that goes on, identity theft, and all of these things. There is really no reason to have passwords. 
we can achieve perfect access without any passwords. If any of you have used medium.com, it shows you why passwords are actually not necessary. We don't need them. And if we get rid of passwords, we get rid of all kinds of problems associated with passwords. You don't even need to remember them too, which is a good thing. Next one, PDF. That's a big one. Everybody has come to love PDFs. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're really there to be an electronic equivalent of the print. And in the time that we don't print anymore, why do we need this? I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really, you know, we create this artificial thing where even journals that are not even printed at all, they have PDFs. Amazing. How did they come up? <laughs> so, uh, and meanwhile, they have all these problems of, uh, you know, you cannot deep link a PDF. Try to read the PDF on your smartphone. It's not reflowable. Okay. Uh, you really, it's really terrible in terms of, of, of user experience, yet I can tell you users, three to one or four to one, use PDF, frankly because the HTML that the publishers produce, not the HTML, the HTML is good. The HTML pages that the publishers produce has so much crap into them that nobody actually wants to read them. So anyway, there is a portable format it's been, it's been around for a number of years. It's an open standard. It's called EPUB. It solves really all the problems that PDF has. It has all the deep linking. It has, it's reflowable. You can view it in a browser. Uh, and it even has an open standard for DRM. So uh, if somebody wants to enforce DRM so that only the people who have access to that, um, uh, to that EPUB can read it, then it's possible to, you know, to do that. Um, so, of course, once we move from PDF to EPUB, guess what goes away? ICANN has PDF goes away. Uh, Libgen goes away. All the other stores where you have unauthorized posting of articles, all of these go away. So, it's going to improve the user experience and it's going to I let the publishers and the libraries work out on the business models that they want to have. And that's what the technology can do. Thank you. Okay. All right. I, uh, I thought I'd start off my section with a haiku. Uh, I've uh, worked in a few different information companies, and about 10 or 15 years ago, a company I was at to try to liven up the workplace decided to have a haiku contest. It had to focus on uh, the, the work we were doing. And this was one of the entrants that kind of stuck in my mind and seemed somehow relevant to this current, uh, uh, current discussion. Um, as, uh, as, as Adam has uh, mentioned in the introduction, we wanted to take a look at this from uh, multiple angles, the, the, the challenge of uh, piracy and, and what it means for, uh, for what we all do. So uh, I think there's multiple meanings in this haiku, and I think with the current situation, maybe even a couple of, uh, a couple of new meanings have, have come in. Um, I attended uh, Carolyn's presentation at, uh, at ALA in uh, Orlando in July and was really struck by the statistics that she gave, particularly uh, in the motivations for using Sci-Hub, which, uh, which she gave a few minutes ago, um, and the, uh, the, the speed access of it. Um, it's, uh, notice that cost is uh, down there at 13%, where it's speed, speed is at 26%. Um, so I think the question that I would hope that everybody in this room uh, asks themselves is uh, how, how do you want your user community accessing the content uh, that is available that maybe you've already paid for or that uh, you'd be willing to find some way to pay for if the, if, if the use uh, 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 could, could be granted to them. Um, now, since I've been in the uh, information business for uh, couple of decades now, I, I always find it informative to take a look at uh, how other content industries deal with uh, issues that are related to the, uh, well, to, 
to, to their delivery of their forms of content. Uh, so I often take a look at what's going on with uh, the, video, uh, the delivery of video um, and what, what are the business models that are in use there, delivery of audio. audio. Um, I think s software is different enough that it's maybe not quite as informative, but I think um, particularly with, um, uh, with music delivery, you know, obviously the, the internet has brought us uh, all kinds of forms of uh, disruption to all kinds of business models. Uh, I, and I think we all know what's happened uh, to, the, to the music industry. So the, I think the lessons that I see in the music industry is that initially with, when, uh, with Napster being the sort of at the, uh, at the forefront of disrupting uh, the, the music industry as, as we knew it previously, uh, I, I, my interpretation is there, there was a real failure to pay attention to, to users and what users wanted. Uh, and while I think that that's been turned around uh, somewhat in the, uh, very recently, and I think, well, I'll speak for myself here, as a, as a listener of music, I'm much more satisfied with the options that I have available to me today than I was 10 years ago. Um, I think that uh, I think there's been lasting damage in the music industry uh, by a failure to pay attention to what users want and, and need. Um, I think the evolution in the video uh, industry is is a little different, and I think that there's um, uh, been a higher level of success, a higher level of user satisfaction, perhaps. Uh, and I think less of a uh, lasting damage to, to the, uh, looking at it from the perspective of the content producers and content owners, less of a, less of a lasting damage to the, to, to the business model. The, um, now, of course, copyright law uh, underlies a lot of this. Uh, and I think, if, again, if you go back to the pre-internet era, copyright law, at least in the US, um, was a matter of civil law. Uh, but through disruption, we've seen changes to that. Uh, I think most noticeably, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act um, uh, has uh, criminalized some aspects uh, of copyright law. Um, and that certainly uh, comes into play uh, anytime you have DRM on, on content. Um, and then to a, uh, maybe a step or two removed, but the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is something that has been um, looked at as a potential way of addressing uh, copyright infringement if it involves uh, sharing of passwords or breaking uh, uh, what would be viewed as appropriate um, authentication to access that content. Uh, so when I, uh, when I started looking at the um, uh, putting this uh, presentation together, my uh, original intent was to give a little bit of an overview of the um, uh, a little bit of an overview of the legal landscape and whether any of the legal challenges that have happened in other content industries might provide any sort of pointers or guidance or foreshadowing, however you want to look at it, to what might happen to uh, uh, to the uh, scholarly publishing industry uh, and the user community uh, if uh, if. if piracy continues in the way it has been? Are, are, are the users at risk? Are, are libraries at legal risk? Um, I, uh, but not being an attorney, uh, I wasn't prepared to give any sort of a legal analysis here. And I ended up uh, changing uh, my, my um, uh, the, uh, changing my uh, uh, presentation just a little bit after attending the uh, green and gold open access uh, uh, session on, I think it was Thursday afternoon, and I don't know if Jason Price is in the, the room. All right, excellent. Well, I you know, was really, uh, I, I thought that was an excellent session, and I really enjoyed, uh, uh, really enjoyed the way Jason presented uh, the, uh, the overview of uh, open access and, uh, and, and piracy and the user experience and what's, what's available. And, well, I don't think that it's, uh, I wouldn't otherwise want to include open access and piracy in the same discussion. I think what really came out from, what, uh, from Jason's presentation is that from a user perspective, it doesn't matter. 
uh, whether it's pirated content or open access content. They just know that they want the content and the distinction of whether their access is legal or not is often not necessarily known to them or they don't necessarily care. So uh, the, and certainly I think one of the differences with accessing uh, um, uh, scholarly publications, and I, I think in the, the last session uh, there was quite a discussion of fair use, I think uh, the, the, the fair use aspect makes it a lot less clear whether the, uh, you know, if we're talking about scholars accessing content, at what point does, it, does, does the fact that whether that content was pirated or not, uh, to, at what point does it matter? The point is that they, they want it quick uh, and they want access. And I don't think, um, you know, Carolyn makes the point that it's a social justice issue. It's not, I don't think it's the intent of anybody to, to, to deny access. Uh, we just need, there's a, there's a business model behind publishing that obviously needs to be, uh, needs to be supported somehow. So the, um, I think uh, one of the other key differences here in looking at the scholarly publishing industry and user community uh, in contrast to music and video, for example, um, is that there's, uh, with, with scholarly publishing, there's a professional class who is responsible for curating and ensuring access to the content. Well, obviously, that doesn't exist in, in, in music and video. So, I really appreciated uh, uh, Giorgio's uh, uh, sort of laying out some of the basic elements of the solution. Um, I, in the time that I've been looking at this challenge, uh, I don't uh, myself uh, have any, um, I, I don't proclaim to know what the solution is uh, to the piracy challenge. I do think, however, that we need to pay attention to the users. To, to the users. Uh, I think uh, that's, that was the point that I really got out of Jason's presentation. I think that's the point that the, or the lesson that we can learn from the music industry is that it's essential to pay attention to what users are doing um, uh, and what users need to do and want to do, what their work habits are, what their workflow is uh, in any solution that we come up with. Otherwise, we're not actually solving, um, uh, solving anything. And I think if we, if we fail to do that, the challenge of piracy is a an existential threat, not just to the publishing industry, but to, to, to libraries as we know it, because I think that's what we heard from both, uh, from Heather and Carolyn, that uh, users are essentially going around the library in order to get the access, whether it's easier, faster, whatever it, uh, uh, what, whatever it may be. Thanks. So we have some time for some questions. Uh, if you could step up to uh, one of the microphones and uh, identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, let's, uh, you know, yo ho ho, let's go. Yo ho ho. Um, I'm Athena Hepner, uh, electronic resources librarian at the University of Central Florida. And as an re electronic resources librarian, I deal with people trying to access the content and sometimes failing. Um, the, the, res the comments about Adipon um, having an idea for frictionless access, of course, caught my attention. I'm wondering if you're looking at basically shibboleth and open Athens type uh, technologies for that. And um, in my experience, those are far from fr frictionless for people. So can you talk to that uh, about that a little bit? No, it's. Um, Sorry. Yes. Um, no, I, 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 I don't, I, this is, in this session I didn't go into the details of this. Um, no, it doesn't necessarily have to do anything, as a matter of fact, to do with uh, Sibboleth. It can, you can use Sibboleth. Um, the, the architecture is that, <clears throat> briefly, authentication goes, away, goes out of the publisher site. Publisher sites will no longer do authentication. The authentication will actually be done at the institution site. And then there is an open network of WAVE servers. There's a WAVE cloud. WAVE stands for where are you from. Uh, that connects, that is the glue between the publisher site and the institution authentication. Uh, the, the user can uh, authenticate at the institution in any way that the institution seems uh, likes it. It could also be just plain an email with the domain of the institution itself. It doesn't even have to do any, any authentication. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's good to hear. Yeah, IP authentication, that goes away. That's awesome. But um, I guess one of my questions. Could you identify yourself? Please? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, Daniel Dollar, I'm uh, Director of Collection Development at Yale University. Um, but it seems to me that one of our really big problems is we have all these multiple platforms. And so um, you had, uh, there was a slide about, well, you had Napster, and now you have Spotify and things like that. We don't live in that world yet. So it seems to me that this, like Sci-Hub, yeah, it's a precursor to something that we need to get to. But it doesn't seem as if publishers, I mean, we need an outside force to come in. And, and you know, if we have an outside force come in, there's all kinds of issues with that. But I mean, there are these big tech players. When is one of them going to step into this space and bring order to our chaotic universe? <laughs> and, and I understand that's really problematic in a lot of ways about privacy, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems like it's going to happen, I think. I think it needs to happen. I imagine you're addressing this to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we are the biggest uh, tech player, and uh, we've been growing. Um, I'm not of the opinion that there should be only one tech player in this industry. Um, the solution that we've actually created for IP authentication is open sourced, is going to be open sourced, and the wife cloud will belong to everybody, not to one institution. I myself uh, am a big believer in privacy. I don't think that publishers should necessarily get the information from the users, uh, and I don't think that uh, the wave cloud should record any information uh, of who the user is, uh, and it should belong to any institution or publisher who wants to put a server on there running open source software. Okay, so uh, if you know, if all the publishers come to Atipon eventually, I would love that. But you know, uh, and definitely we're working towards making that possible. But I don't know if that's also going to be possible. There is another problem. Um, which is uh, slightly you know, related to what you're saying, unrelated to access, which is, frankly, that the current way of selling content just doesn't make any sense. The current way of aggregations makes no sense. Um, there should be different aggregations. We will talk about it next year. <laughs> Still Athena, so. Uh, I've been wanting to find out, and here's a publisher I can ask, how often do the people landing on your page come from a recognized source uh, as opposed to getting just a paywall? And how often does a paywall convert into some sort of authorized access, whether they're paying or they've logged in? Um, I wish I had this information. How many times people come in from a, uh, from an, from a source that we know about um, if you're talking about the, the search engines, uh, is that what you're saying? Uh, search engines or whatever, all of them have an interesting article. Uh -huh. It's about, depends on the discipline. Um, it's about 50%, I would say, comes from search engines and other, other places. And another 50% we don't know, which means that either the user typed in the URL, unlikely, or they came through um, another uh, article reference because of the way things are set up right now. It's actually bad, that's another problem. Um, uh, with uh, the, the resolution happening through the handle, um, there is, um, uh, I would imagine that it, they come also from, uh, from federated searches or from uh, uh, library systems. So about 50% come either direct through discovery, through different discovery mechanisms or uh, through library systems. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I would say 80% plus. I, yeah, I don't have, anecdotally, I would say about 80, more than 80%, they come from, uh, from institutions that we recognize. If I could just add, add, add a little comment to that. I have an answer that's maybe partially an answer to the, uh, to, to the previous question. Uh, the, if, if you consider that a lot of users have as their starting point now Google Scholar, for example, uh, and I think that was something else that Jason uh, Price made a really good point of in his uh, presentation the other day, 
uh, there are ways to get from Google Scholar to content that you're entitled to. Uh, however, uh, th th those, those ways to do that aren't necessarily all that well known, aren't necessarily set up by, by their institution or by their user. Uh, Jason gave a, a quick example of one of them. Uh, the company that I work for has also created a technology that makes that happen. And so from that perspective, we happen to know, now most of our customers are corporate libraries, uh, pharmaceutical companies and the like, uh, although we do have a growing customer base in, uh, uh, at universities. But I know the statistics for um, corporate uh, institutions best, uh, and we find that if you consider a large, uh, large R&D company, uh, which maybe has a lot of subscriptions and other uh, maybe token access, et cetera, we know that a, it, it's roughly 50% of all the content that a particular user might want to access, that user has some form of entitled access to. And that means, of course, there's 50% where that user doesn't have access and might have to uh, pay by the piece in, in some manner. So it's 10.30, uh, which means it's time for a break, which will be here. Don't go to the Galliard Center. Um, Thank you for attending. I hope we can get a round of applause for our speakers. And uh, so thanks again, and we'll see you guys back here at 11.